Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of the Spotlight on Wasandam TV, Prime Television, the YouTube channel of Prime Television, which takes place every Monday at 9 p.m., bringing to you a story that ignites change in our country and around the world. Now, democracy and education are well spoken about subjects, you know, at this present day. So, but what happens when two of these combined, when both of these come together? To speak about this, we have someone very important in our studio. Yasudara Patanjali. She is a life coach and she is a co-founder of ICS, Sri Lanka's first formal alternative school. So thank you for joining us today and well, let's see what the next Rwana is going to look like. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to finally meet you and do this. <laughs> no problem. So let's start off. It's a huge topic that we have to cover. Let's start about your personal journey and what inspired you to get into this field and what is this thing called democratic education? It's quite new. I, the concept is quite old but yeah. it's quite new to Sri Lankans. It's very new. Yeah. So what is it all about? Uh, to, I suppose, talk about my background first. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I moved to Sri Lanka almost seven years ago. Okay. Yeah, coming up to seven years ago. And um, I've always homeschooled my kids mm -hmm. and I was homeschooled myself. Okay. So there's this kind of alternative education story arc throughout my life. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I was very young, I really kind of, when I started to notice that we were different, you mm -hmm. know, I wasn't going to school and other kids were going to school. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of questions about, you know, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. How does it benefit us? And what I really saw was that, um, there was a lot of freedom in it. Okay. Not necessarily that freedom was my experience also, mm. but I saw the potential for freedom. Yeah. That um, a child can develop into their true being mm -hmm. rather than sort of being a cookie cutter version that schools tend to put out all over the world. Mm. And I should say I grew up in London, not here. Yeah. So uh, there was a lot of, but the education system is pretty much the same from UK to here. Yeah. So, you know, there's not much difference. Um, so very young, I had decided that I was going to homeschool my kids, um, even before you like that concept. I like that you like that freedom that came along with it. Freedom is something that's very important to me. I think it's something that if we are all given more of, mm -hmm. we can all thrive more. The the more we are told, be this shape, yeah. think like this, dress like this, behave like this, do this, by external parties, um, we diminish a lot of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that freedom is something that's very important and it's important for humans. Um, yeah. We have become the human civilization because of that, because we had the freedom to create and to innovate, yeah. um, to problem solve our own way, to create culture, um, science, all of these things. Um, so yes, so then I moved to Sri Lanka um, and I had worked with a lot of um, homeschooling communities back in the UK. I had led two different communities over there. So when I came here and I saw there was nothing like that here, but I could, I started to connect with other parents who were homeschooling. So I kind of started building that homeschooling community here. So you networked? Networked mm -hmm. and kind of brought everyone together. We used to do some, you know, trips out. Um, okay. get the kids together on different days to do different activities so there was a nice sense of community obviously covid uh, it, had a yeah. you know impact on that um, but through that journey you know and of course because of my social media presence as well yeah. i speak to so many parents i get like 150 dms a day from mm. various kinds of people but a yeah. majority are parents okay so speaking to all these parents through these last um, seven years, one of the key things that came out was you homeschool your kids. We see every day from your Instagram stories the kind of lifestyle, the childhood that your children are having. How can we access that? But we are not ready to homeschool. Whether it's financial reasons, personal reasons, whatever, they're not able to make that leap. So that question kept coming up. And I was always shying away saying, no, yeah. no, I'll just focus on my kids. Yeah. Um, but this sort of last year, I started thinking, okay, maybe I should. Make a change. Make a change. And this year, uh, me and my husband decided, okay, let's do this. The demand is there. Um, also, I think post-COVID, people have finally opened up to think, what is this traditional education? Is it really serving our lives, mm -hmm. our children? Um, so it's the right time 
it's a very scary time <laughs> to be doing. I mean, if you're going to start anything new, it's a scary yeah, time. There is a sense of fear. Yeah, that's it's, true. It's it's a lot to take on, but it's also super exciting. Um, so yeah, so that's the kind of how I've ended up here um, with only like three and a half months before the school opens. <laughs> All right. So now democratic education, when did it start? Has it been there since some time? Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely something that I think from a traditional education perspective, we are so used to being told that even parenting and education both, we are always told that it's a hierarchical thing. Mm. Children should listen and not talk back. Children should do because we know better and that um, that is the right way for them to learn. I think recently on social media, I've see, been seeing a lot of posts that say, uh, if you think that suffering is an inherent part of learning for your child. The first thing you need to grapple with for yourself mm. is that you didn't need to suffer to learn either, but you were made to. Yeah. And because we are made to, we pass it on to the next generation. Um, but democratic, carry it forward. You carry it forward because yeah. it's all we know. Yeah. Um, the idea of democratic education actually dates back to the 1600s. Way back in time. Way back. My goodness. Um, okay. The first democratic school that we that is recorded. Okay. Uh, there may have been others that have slipped through history, we don't know. But Leo Tolstoy in Russia had the first democratic school in the 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, no, sorry, 1800s. 1800. Um, and then 1920s, the real movement uh, began. began. Because actually, if you think about it, it's only at the end of the 1800s that formal schools anyway became a thing. It's not like we had formal schools where all children attended mm. before the end of the 1890s, uh, 1800s anyway. Yeah. So literally within 30, 40 years of formal schools uh, becoming a thing worldwide, um, democratic schools started popping up. So it's mm. almost as old as traditional education. Why does it stand out from traditional education? What makes it so special? What takes place in a democratic school? Um, just like traditional school isn't one thing mm -hmm. uh, you will get if we take maybe a school in Sri a government school in Sri Lanka it will mm -hmm. be very different to an international school in Sri Lanka which might mm -hmm. be very different to a Japanese school let's say you know traditional schooling also is a very diverse um, thing yeah um, the same with homeschooling the same with democratic education it really depends on the context of I suppose uh, how that school was founded, what principles it was founded under, and then the students and the teachers and the staff um, who are connected to it. Um, in a very broad sense, democratic education means that a student within that has the same amount of say, a one-to-one -one vote, shall we say, mm -hmm. um, to decide on their education, on what happens in the school, and I know there are schools, democratic schools in the world where the students have an equal vote in hiring and firing from teachers to staff. So from what age does this start for the child to make a vote? So the schools where that level of democracy is available, it tends to be secondary school, so 12 upwards. Does a child have the capacity to know that this person can be fired? So it's a voting thing. So the, the student themselves are not deciding, but as a democratic unit, everyone in the school. So the teachers and the other staff will also have the same amount of votes. Um, mm -hmm. So it's one of the in interesting elements of democratic education for me is exactly your question. Because I think socially, forgetting education for a second, socially we don't empower, empower our students or children to make those kind of decisions. But being in an environment where that is part of their life, that is part of what is expected of them also. The other side of it is that you do skill them, you do empower them, you do teach them how to think openly, how to question these things. So one of the actually criticisms of democratic education is that a normally schooled child or a mainstream traditional school child might not have the skills to really connect with a democratic system. Mm -hmm. But I suppose that's all the, also the criticism of democracy full stop. Yeah. You know, when we talk about elections, one of the questions is, well, is everyone really competent enough to vote? Yeah. And all over the world, the resounding answer is no. 
Mm, right? That's true. Um, but so it is. It is a, a, a weakness, I suppose, in the democratic system in whatever way that you roll it out. Um, but because a school is a smaller unit than a country, we are more able to empower our students and to create the structures that then benefit the school and the students alike. Mm. Now, can this level of democracy? in education, can it be put into a traditional school or does it have to be uh, a separate school altogether? Can that system be implemented into a traditional school? I think uh, absolutely and I think the school would benefit from that mm -hmm. but definitely in, as, as with any system change there needs to be a transition period. So I think what we discussed just now about the lack of skill or empowerment in a traditional setting we can't just overnight hand over that kind of um, control. Yeah. So having that transition period, um, so actually even for my school now, when we open in January, um, for the first six months, we are actually running a transition period because the students will not be joining us from a similar background. They will be joining us from the system, from the normal system. Okay. So already even for our school, the first six months are actually designed to operate differently to how the rest of the time at school will go because we have to have this time when we are um, supporting our students to become um, people who can competently engage in that system in the democratic system mm -hmm. so we so that transition system is very important so you were also mentioning the child will have the power to hire and fire a teacher does that include principals as well? Um, democratic schools don't have principals. No principals. No so principal. who is the head? The school. Okay. I'm the co. Me and my husband will be co-founders. Okay. That is just. Y'all are just finding. We are co-founders. Okay. Y'all are setting the foundation for the, the school. Foundation. Yeah. So, if there is a need yeah. for a decision to be taken, yeah. what happens? Um, collective um, committee. Mm -hmm. um, very communist era like but uh, it's it's supposed to be run on so the school that I um, look up to the most is a school that's in the UK that has been there for about 40 years okay um, they have a system where there are two um, sets of governing bodies one that is more day-to-day -day and one that is more bigger issues like um, what so I suppose what we talked about, the hiring, firing type okay. of things, the, the bigger, the direction the school should take, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And then the day-to-day -day, um, group, uh, which all people within the school have access to. to what make about the, the first one you were mention, mentioning? Who is in that for the hiring and firing? Who comes so under that? So that is um, voted by the students. So, okay. so it's a limited number of people. Oh, okay. um, our school will not necessarily run on the same lines mm -hmm. because we have a bigger age group. So we are that open to we, from four upwards. Four upwards. So we can't be expecting four or five year olds to be taking yes. such big decisions. So we have a much more um, incremental system mm -hmm. that is being built currently mm -hmm. uh, where we can still empower our students mm. uh, but safeguard the school at the same time. Let's talk about when you were is when you're establishing the school what are the challenges that came up with it? It wouldn't have been easy. It's not been easy um, but for me it's challenges are only difficult when I suppose you're being made to do it or you feel you have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, education and child development is something that I'm very passionate about. So challenges are more moments to think and moments to f figure things out rather than kind of difficulties. Yeah. Um, Did you have any legal issues in getting it established with? So Sri Lanka sadly mm -hmm. um, doesn't have registration for international schools. Um, all the international schools are just registered businesses. Um, terrifying. <laughs> um, so there's no regulation in Sri Lanka anyway, mm -hmm. um, even though I firmly believe there should be and it should be kind of uh, more stringent or it, there, there should be a kind of inspectorate. Uh, Sri Lanka also doesn't have a national school ins inspectorate either. Mm. Um, so in terms of that part of it, it has been pretty easy. Okay. Um, which is why we anyway in Sri Lanka we see a lot of schools popping so up. So the school will be established as a private yes. business? Yeah, okay. as all international schools yeah. are. 
yeah um getting so we um we couldn't actually believe it when cambridge exam board um approved our school so that actually has been the bigger hurdle not hurdle it's been the bigger mountain to climb okay because uh we weren't sure whether our methods and um sort of non traditional approach would fit well with what they're expecting so to get that approval and to become a cambridge school was mind blowing what, what are the other credibility boosts that you all have for the school so um the being part of so actually i'm flying out to nepal um next month okay. uh, for the international democratic school conference conference um so i'm trying very hard at the moment to ensure that we are not alone mm -hmm. um is there a bigger community in, in the other countries as well or is it still budding budding it's mm -hmm. there are currently about 2000 schools global globally yeah okay um so it's a pretty good number i think i don't think to it's a small off. number yeah um india at the moment doesn't seem to have any but i'm hoping that information is wrong that mm -hmm. when i go to the conference that there there you is can enough clear it out. Yeah, yeah i'm really that's something i'm really <laughs> really looking to uh, clarify because i'd really love to connect with indian yeah. schools that have already done this because mm. it's closest neighbor we yeah. should have that community um also uh, we are the first formal democratic school in sri lanka there are a couple of very small um informal quotation mark schools in sri lanka who've mm -hmm. taken the democratic approach okay but they don't offer any qualifications or any kind of future pathway i okay. suppose mm -hmm. so there are more opportunities for children to safeguard their childhood mm. um while being in a learning environment um but being able to offer them a levels and o levels and you know throughout education assessments and checkpoints mm -hmm. um that really makes us different because we are giving them the same opportunities as a school as a traditionally school child but just with a better childhood <laughs> for want of a a better way of phrasing it so what how will you be formulating the curriculum for this for the child so and how will you assist them because will you be having exams what is the process like so anyway globally i think even sri lanka has just announced that they want to walk away from um, yeah. regular exams for young children mm. uh, that o levels should really be the first time that students face you know sort of the exam conditions uh, this was one of the reasons we went with cambridge because all of their assessments up to uh, o level mm -hmm. or igcse as it is yeah um they are so um what i would call child friendly that um they are not put under exam conditions but They're how will the child how will you know assessed. when the child is ready to you know answer something so because if there is no exam per se how will you know that the child has understood the assignment so the other part of my school is that we are also 100% project based okay so there are no subjects there are no grade 1 so there is no curriculum that you will be curriculum. following there is oh, curriculum okay. but the cur so uh, cambridge curriculum underpins everything we do so that is the baseline will there be monitoring yeah of course because we will be using their assessment tools mm -hmm. to assess our, our students okay but again because we are a democratic school students and parents have autonomy over the education which means we will not be making anything mandatory but the students and parents can choose to be assessed okay because so they can I, also choose to not not be assessed because not every child needs to be mm -hmm. and not maybe every parent wants to i know many parents who i've spoken to over the years yeah i know one of the children who actually already has enrolled in our school the parents are very firm saying for the next few years we actually don't want any school sort of type exam. behavior mm -hmm. for for our child so the beauty of having a personalized curriculum a personalized experience for every child is that we can actually take all of those comments on board personalized experience for every child what yeah. does that mean so if you uh, so the example i just mentioned um this set of parents they would yeah. like their child to be allowed to experience life without much curriculum for the next few years very young child mm -hmm. um so we are able to provide that but at the same time if another parent came with the same age child and they were more keen on 
following particular areas of education, we would be able to cater to that because every child in my school has a personalised curriculum, a personalised pathway. So just to get this straight, I, when I'm trying to understand yeah. this concept, <laughs> so the child comes to school yeah. and there is no classroom? Or? No. Mm. <laughs> So, so there, is there a tutor or is there course, someone with the child? Of course. So, so let's say there are 30 kids in the class, there will be 30 tutors? No, 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 absolutely not. Um, so the golden uh, standard globally is 18 to 1 ratio. Mm -hmm. We're doing 12 to 1 because we want to do kind of, in order to really deliver personalized education, you need to increase the number of facilitators or teachers. Yeah. So 12 to 1 is what we are going for. Um, so with that, every child has their uh, own projects, might be group projects, might be individual projects. Mm -hmm. They have their own activities, they have, and we also have a whole host of, we have the longest list of extracurriculars, um, from filmmaking to pottery to arts and crafts, embroidery to science to STEM to, if you, just if you so look at the So there will website, be educators for each of these fields? Yes. Yeah, so as workshops, mm -hmm. because, but when you look at, let's say, I was actually writing the uh, projects of, within a project-based curriculum, each project you have to um, identify the learning. Mm -hmm. So one I, I was just doing last night is cross-stitch. Now cross-stitch doesn't normally come up in conversations about education, yeah. Yeah. but actually it teaches maths, it teaches um, design. It teaches um, color coordination. Color coordination. Yeah. It teaches wool and and texture and material and what that is and how does wool actually let us do this, right? Yeah. And how does synthetic wool differ from cotton and uh, natural, um, you know, products? So, just from a simple example like that, um, and for the older kids, when it comes to a cross stitch project, mm. there'd be a write up. So there would be language skills and communication skills that have to be included because they'll have to work out, okay, my, my project idea is this, I wish to create this kind of cross-stitch project. Maybe I'm doing a cushion, maybe I'm doing a panel, I don't know. Okay. Um, so, so there are so many skills from one thing that we can pull out. And the beauty of project-based learning is that for the, you know, you get most kids at school who say, oh, I hate maths, yeah. I hate French, mm. I hate this, right? Yeah. But when you're working on a project, how do you pick one element and say, I hate it? Because actually, you're really enjoying doing something. Mm -hmm. Now, even you and I dis talking here today, yeah. we can pull out so much learning from just this experience. But True. we can't pull out one and say, you know, the writing both of, both of us would have done to prepare for today. Mm -hmm. We can't say, oh, I hate English now because of this. We yeah. can't, because it's part of yeah. the experience. It's more complex than that. So it really engages children. Um, actually, all the research for project-based learning versus traditional, every single research has proven that it's by far more impactful, more effective. More successful. More successful. So let's create a scenario. Okay. Let's say I'm a student yeah. who wants to enroll in your school. And let's say I want to sort of learn in the field of embroidery, like you were saying. So what would my ideal day look like at your school? Just because you have that one goal in mind mm -hmm. doesn't mean you can let go of the others. Like So I have the opportunity to explore some yes. other avenues as well. Absolutely, because I think at one of the other problems with traditional schooling is that we kind of narrow down a student's, so if you're taking, let's say, a common stream, mm. what about the arts, what about science, what about all the other areas that you have let go of, right? And that doesn't help because the later in life, and particularly the world has changed a lot. Yeah. We are no longer in that um, in that lifestyle where you know at 18 you learn something and then you do that till you retire. Yeah. And that's it. That that used to be my grandparents' yeah, a generation. A lot of a lot of A-level students have this issue. They want to select one subject from one stream, and yeah. it's not you know if you choose yeah. arts, it's arts. Yeah. It's commerce. You can't do cross subjects. No. Um, so which is only in Sri there. Lanka. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure it might be in other countries, but I obviously yeah. grew up in the UK, so we didn't face that. So I did, for my A-levels, I did maths, further maths, English mm. literature, IT and history. Mm. So very varied. Yeah. And it gives you a balance. It really gives you a balance. Because yeah. when you get older, particularly the way the world is going, we are going into, you know, sort of uh, gig work. 
we're going to multiple income streams. We're looking at diverse portfolios for everyone, yeah. rather than a, I became an accountant, I'll die an accountant, yeah. which is what happened 100 years ago. So which means education has to also provide diverse experience. So just because if you are still the student that you were enrolling, yeah. you want to do embroidery now, it doesn't mean that in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time, that is exactly what you need. Mm -hmm. So we have to always as a school and as parents, make sure that while we empower you, encourage you to follow that, yeah. we also encourage you to learn all the other skills that come with it. Because as I said, even embroidery yeah. can teach you so much more. But that we don't also shut off your avenues in future by cutting you off from math, Maths, science, yeah. languages, whatever history, everything else. So projects allow us to engage the child more. Uh, because as I said earlier, subjects can be very off-putting, but not when they're projects, mm -hmm. not when they are things that you can be active in and get excited about. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was about 11 or 12, um, I had a project where I, I think my mom had said, um, just go whoever you want, any historical figure, okay. um, do some research and create like a thing, a, a file, a presentation. Mm -hmm. And I think I did that project for about, I mean, I might still be doing that project. Okay. <laughs> um, I chose um, Trotsky okay. uh, from, you know, Russian Revolution era. And I mean, to this day, I'm still reading books on Trotsky. It's a lifelong passion that was unleashed by that. Um, my brother chose a bunch of dead French philosophers, and I think he's still, still possibly okay. involved in that. Um, have they become income avenues? No, but has it added to our skill set, our depth, and you know who we are? Absolutely. Absolutely. So those things really matter. Let's talk about you know some people, some parents might be very skeptical on sending there. You know they might have some fear in taking that first step. How do you talk to these parents? I think um, I think that's that's the issue. That's the main issue why mm. education actually hasn't moved on much as well. It's very stagnant. Yeah. Because um, I've taken on a bet, mm. and so far I'm winning. All right. Uh, <laughs> that I have yet to speak to a parent who okay. says that mainstream traditional education mm. is perfect. That it's really serving their child. Um, no one has said that. And I keep waiting, I'm like, one day I might meet a parent, but it has not happened so far. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have I instead is parents and children who are making the best of a bad situation. Mm. Um, they, and, and they will have different perspectives on what is bad and what is good about the situation, that's fine. But um, there's no one who says, this is really good for my child. Um, and that is everywhere, all over the world, mm. right? Um, but there is a fear in changing, in what if I take my child and my child is happy, my child, uh, my child has a good childhood, as a, um, is very empowered, is very secure, their mental health is safeguarded, they will not face bullying or any adverse uh, experiences at school. Um, but there is always that fear like, yes, 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 that's all there. Yeah. But what if they're not a success in the future? Mm -hmm. And um, this is why um, getting the exams on board for our school was so important to us. Uh, because at the end of the day, what really safeguards, um, from a very traditional point of view, mm -hmm. a, a student's future, yeah. is the fact that they have their O-levels and A-levels. Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what people look at. So being able to provide that is very important. Mm. Um, on the other side, project-based learning is hands down. As I said, there is not one piece of research anywhere that says project-based learning is not as good as traditional. Uh, because the education in terms of their knowledge and skill level is better. Mm -hmm. But so is their mental health. So are their social skills. And if, you, if anybody Googles what do children need for the future, because also now with the uh, AI coming in, yeah. with the rapid change around the world, with so many different things, climate yeah. change also is a huge part in this conversation. Yeah. Uh, with how quickly the world is changing, we have no certainty about what will happen in 10, 20 years time. Yeah, in true. fact, uh, 
from we are in 2023 mm. in just 7 years time 2030 globally we have no idea of what 86% of jobs that will be available in 2030 are that's just 7 years away forget mm-hmm. a child who's starting school this year who's 4 yeah. or 5 yeah. even my daughter who just turned 13 mm. the jobs that she will go into 86% there is no one on the on the planet who knows what they are that's a statistic anybody can google it and find out right yeah. so we have to we have moved on from a world where knowledge like fact knowledge and specific skill is what will help our children succeed in the future mm. what will help them instead i think there's a thing somewhere that says it's a, a critical thinking problem solving communication collaboration um anyway it's a list like that i think it's got six or seven points on it mm. so none of those are subject based um knowledge Right. What about now some parents might argue and say okay traditional schools will sort of promote social responsibility how to be a good citizen Absolutely. discipline how will a democratic a uh, school implement that since the child has so much of freedom you know the child might not even realize the value of social responsibility i think actually when you have more freedom mm. that is when you realize your responsibility a lot mm. more we for generations we have gone to school yeah. but we have a society that doesn't vote mm. that doesn't engage in their um, active citizenship that does not look after the environment that That's doesn't true. look after that has no empathy for their neighbors or the people around um traditional so schooling do you think does giving not. a child that freedom will sort of improve social responsibility 100% because it it when you empower people Mm-hmm. they are more engaged and they feel that they're valued when you have that hierarchical approach of telling somebody do this do that think yeah. this behave like this their value diminishes and when their value diminishes they don't feel like anything they do matters so again going back to democracy and not voting yeah. people don't vote because you ask them why it's They what does my vote matter, matter. Mm. right so, but when you empower people to feel like they mean something yeah so that their voice matters that their thoughts their mm. feelings that they're taken into account um it has a huge impact and also one of the key things about i mean it's something as a parent um i talk about these things a lot with my children so definitely as a school we will be very active in discussing our carbon footprint our active citizenship all of these things will be very important to us mm. i also read somewhere according to the universal declaration of human rights and uh, the un convention on the rights of the child it requires the child to um, it's compulsory for the child to have primary education so how do you strike that balance you know a child starting from the age of 4 years old how do you strike that balance so, with democratic education and you know sometimes parents might think um it's it is necessary for the child to have their primary education how will you strike that balance so i think uh, primary anyway mm. is from 5 or 6 depending on the country or 7 yeah. depending on other uh, some very few countries actually the child development research all says it should be 7 yeah. <laughs> but we are slowly bringing the age down uh, i think in the uk it's now dropping down to 2 that they're trying to make it i think sri lanka is also trying to do that mm-hmm. um all the evidence says is very harmful to children but governments yeah. are hell bent on doing it um it's primary education um what that means is that children develop the skills to read and write mm. to do arithmetic to exactly. understand exactly isn't so that that's important all, absolutely and mm-hmm. which we will be covering because Your, that the school will be doing that hundred, focusing on the basic math arithmetic just not sitting at a table from okay. a book um my younger daughter so i have three children mm-hmm. my second child my younger daughter she learned to do simple addition mm-hmm. and subtraction long before she was even given a book because she used to play board games mm-hmm. so there was no headache so activity based learning activity based learning to implement primary the same education thing. because at the end of the day yeah. we are cambridge curriculum underpinned mm-hmm. right so that 
anyway has all of those requirements from us. It's just we will not be teaching those same skills, same knowledge at a table and a desk, sitting down facing the teacher. We will have more engaging spaces, more engaging activities, projects that will help those students. Now a lot of the time, actually the last few days my girls have been doing a sewing project. Okay. So the amount of uh, maths even that comes in, right, from measuring things, yeah. working out the, the dimensions of the material they need. So all of these things, this it's the same skills, it's just a lot more fun and when things are more fun and engaging. So it's learn. learning made fun. Yeah. Learning made fun. So now when I have gone to a traditional school so at the end you you say I have completed this what does it come how does it work for a child who's gone to a democratic school very much depends on what the student or the parents are seeking is there any final qualification is there basically any? they can sit there IGCSE and A level Cambridge okay um, but if the students want to maybe do there are so many options out there from NVQs um, and all kinds of all manner of qualifications and actually the number of qualifications are even growing day by day mm -hmm. because of the digital transformation in education uh, we have so much access now actually pre-covid yeah most of these things were only face-to-face -face things mm -hmm. um, now because of everything going online yeah we can access so many different things so if there's a student as you said if you're this embroidery student applying while we would have focused on making sure that you have a diverse set of skills and knowledge if that is the certification or qualification you want to get at that point mm. let's look for it let's find it and let's guide you to achieve that mm -hmm. um, we are by no means but I also school. can do my IGCSE. Absolutely, absolutely. So it gives you a much greater portfolio of options than if you were in a streamed school. Mm -hmm. um, and it also means that that one thing you do does not mean you have let go of all the other things you should have learned because I'm always very very conscious. I think my husband has changed careers three times. I've lost count of how many times I've changed careers. I have so much experience and I've only been able to do that because I had a very diverse upbringing with diverse education and we need to provide that for our children. They need to be able to put their hands into anything and succeed. Yeah. yeah. And one of the key things about democratic and project-based learning mm. is that it ignites lifelong learning. Mm. Whereas traditional schooling is proven to give you burnout. Because you ask anybody, even you might be, even though it mm. wasn't that long ago, how much do we remember from what we studied? We studied yeah. so hard for our levels and A-levels and even university for me. Mm. What do we remember? Nothing. That's burnout. Because it just came in, did the exam, went out. So yeah. what have I gained other than the piece of paper? But And particularly with the world changing from more skill-based, mm. We can't, for us to succeed, we can't afford to lose the things we learn. Things we learn. Because we, are, we need to be skill-based for the next 50 years to survive. So we have to make sure that education kind of fits with that. Fits with that. All right, we are on the final lap of the show this evening. Seya Sodhara. Now, in terms of educators in this field, how are they chosen? What is their background? For my school? Yes. Uh, we are looking for people with either uh, good qualifications, mm -hmm. um, diverse experience. Okay. Um, I get a few people applying saying, I'm a maths teacher, hire me. And I'm like, no. <laughs> because in order to roll out project-based learning, you have to have a much wider uh, portfolio of interests and okay. things that you know about, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to, you know, do that. And actually, we found some really exciting people. So I'm very excited to about work that, with to work with us. So there are two layers to it. Uh, we have subject matter experts that we are recruiting mm -hmm. who are within the field who will not step into school okay. per se. Uh, who are there to guide our curriculum um, and make it cutting edge okay. um, because globally even the UK curriculum hasn't been updated in about nine years Sri Lanka hasn't updated in seven years we have a system I'm so excited about this we have a system where we will be updating every four months okay uh, which me which is just means that every child in our school will have the most up-to-date most cutting edge knowledge and experience in any, any industry, right? Mm. Um, so that's our one layer, but then our day-to-day -day facilitators in school, the teachers, yeah. uh, we are kind of 
hiring at the moment, looking for people with a lot of good qualifications, good experience, um, good character, you know, people who are interesting and interested people. Yeah. Um, and Charisma trilingual. as well. Charisma is very important. very important. They have to be able to get on the floor and work with a kid, not be there because a lot of teachers have gotten into the field for the to get the respect of the teacher mm -hmm. and that's definitely not what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, so we Just need one on one time with the, yeah, with the child. People who can understand and give respect and receive respect mm -hmm. um, and trilingual because the school is trilingual. Oh brilliant. So uh, let's also talk briefly on why do you think democratic education is important in Sri Lanka? Why do we need it today? I think it's needed everywhere in the world. Okay. Um, but Sri Lanka, because of everything we have been through uh, mm -hmm. in the last, I've lost count of how many years, um, we urgently need change. Um, migration has become a massive issue. Mm. Um, it will become, I think, a much bigger issue in the next couple of years. We will we are losing so many experts. Yeah. Um, we have a, a generation of parents who feel unempowered, mm. who feel there's nothing else to be done. because There's not, nothing left. There's nothing left. Yeah. Uh, there's no such thing as nothing left. Mm. It's all about the, the, the very Instagram-y thing of like, you know, where you water the grass, is the, you know, that's where the grass will yeah. be green. And we have stopped watering. Yeah. Um, but if we did, I mean, yesterday I was at um, uh, an event celebrating and announcing innovations in Sri Lanka. And what amazing talent, brains, just the sh it was mind-blowing energy yesterday. I was so taken aback. And we need, I think we need more people to realize just how much amazing stuff is happening in Sri Lanka. Yeah, uh, instead of leaving and going somewhere In else. search of mm. other pastures, but also we need to grow more people who mm. can be more exciting and innovative in yeah. for Sri Lanka, right? Um, one of the things that we are doing with the school is um, that you know, 2,000 rupees from every month's school fees is going into a savings account for that student. So that when mm. they leave the school, they have an entrepreneurship fund. So the parents My will goodness. not have okay. a headache. There is no burden on the family. We have done the hard work for them so that every child will leave our school, not just with the qualifications, not just with um, the knowledge and the skill they need to succeed in life, not mm. just with a great childhood and great mental health, yeah. but also with an entrepreneurship fund um, that we will be involved in, okay. you know, ensuring they spend it wisely. Wisely. But we want them to go and do something for themselves, and for the country. And to make them independent. And to make them independent. Mm. Um, Which is important. So important. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I'm really excited to finally get to that point in, you know, maybe 10, 15 years down the line where our kids are starting to use that fund. Yeah and you know maybe make a change in our country absolutely and any innovation we make you know yeah. it could be the uh, small product it could be a service that they develop it will change and um, I can't wait I'm so excited all right so we have maybe just one or two minutes left briefly tell us your take-home message to everyone watching us right now oh my gosh um, <laughs> my kids have I think everybody on social media has seen the kind of life the childhood my kids have had um, and the level of education and skill they have. It's time that everybody had it too. All right, so that's your message to everyone and to embrace this new concept yes. as well. Yes, uh, come talk to us. Come talk, there you have it. Well, thank you for joining us today and just as much as I would love the conversation to go on, we have to end <laughs> for today. But thank you very much for joining us no, in our thank studios. You, thank you. So we were in conversation with Yasodra Patanjali. She's a life coach and uh, the co-founder of ICS, Sri Lanka's first uh, formal alternative school in Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us. And that being said, we have to conclude tonight's program. Join us again next Monday at 9 p.m. for the very latest and bringing in a new personality that will bring in change in Sri Lanka and around the world. Take care and good night. <laughs>